This conference will now be recorded. Thank you. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Department of Consumer and Business Services, Division of Financial Regulation, I'm Ethan Baldwin and I welcome you to this public hearing to discuss the division's preliminary rate decisions for a 2021 health benefit plan. The division holds hearings on all individual and small group rate filings. Each hearing is generally limited to discussion of the division's preliminary decision and final objections regarding the filing. During this time, carriers will be permitted to defend their assumptions using information submitted in the filing or indicate agreement with the findings. Carriers may not introduce new information or propose new or revised assumptions at this time. When reviewing a rate request, division actuaries consider such factors as recent and projected medical care and prescription drug costs, including any benefit changes, past and future loss ratios, that is how much of every premium dollar goes to pay health care claims costs, this is to ensure the requested rate is not projected to take, trigger federal rebates or payments from other federal programs. Division actuaries also review the recent history of rate changes, the overall financial strength, including profitability, investment income, and surplus of the company, and the administrative costs. Division staff must also ensure that the filings meet all requirements of the Affordable Care Act and determine whether or not the anticipated number of enrollees will adversely affect an insurer's financial position. You can review the full rate request for all companies on our website, www.organhealthrates.org. All communication for every health insurance rate change filing, including written answers to all questions asked during the review period, are posted there as well. In this afternoon's hearing, we are discussing in this order the preliminary rate decisions the division has made on individual and small group health benefit plans filed by Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of the Northwest and Providence Health Plan. Our agenda will be representatives from each company describing their request. Then division staff will lead a discussion about the division's preliminary decision on each filing. And finally, we will accept public testimony. If you'd like to make a comment on a company's filing, please unmute, introduce yourself, and make a comment. Comments will, be also, will also be accepted online through 11.59 p.m. today, July 8th. The division will make a final decision about these filings shortly after the public comment period ends on July 8th. Kaiser, please begin by introducing yourself and explaining your rate request. Hello, this is Luke Hampton. I am a senior associate actually at Kaiser Permanente. I worked on the small group rate filing, which has a little over 30,000 members. We are requesting a 3.5% rate increase on average with a minimum rate increase of 0.6% and a maximum of 5.4%. None of our plans are being discontinued for 2021. We are not making any changes to our rating factors. Uh, hi, this is Katie Meiser. Do you do you want me to go ahead and uh, discuss the individual rating as well, or do you want to talk about the small group one first? Uh, yeah, actually, actually, go ahead and introduce the individual, and then uh, our staff will discuss their findings on both filings after that. Okay, great. Uh, so again, my name is Katie Meiser. I'm a senior actuarial associate at Kaiser as well. Um, for the individual filing, we are expecting this to impact approximately uh, 37,500 37, members approximately. Um, the average annual rate increase is expected to be a decrease of 3.5% with a minimum rate change uh, at a negative 8.6% and a maximum rate change at 4.3%. We have one plan that's being discontinued, the catastrophic plan, and one new bronze plan, the 8,550 plan is what we're calling it, and the approximate 100 members that were on the catastrophic plan will be mapped to this new lean bronze plan. Um, there are no major factors being revised in this filing. Thank you. Division staff will now lead a discussion about the division's review of the filings and preliminary decisions. Thank you, Ethan. My name is Michael Sink, Senior Life and Health Actuary for the Division of Financial Regulation and Primary Reviewer of the filing. And this is Lou Savage, uh, Division Administrator for DFR. Uh, T.K. Keene, Deputy Administrator for DFR. And Brian Fordham, sitting in for Tasha Sizemore um, from DFR. 
And this is Ying Liu. I'm the secondary review of this filing. All right, thank you. I'm going to just dive right into this. Uh, we reviewed both the individual and small group Kaiser filings uh, for 2021. Uh, quick, I'm going to quickly go over the process in which we review uh, these filings for the individual filing. And then uh, afterwards, I will go over the differences with the small group filing, uh, but the process is very similar. We review three primary categories when we review these filings. We review the uh, appropriate data, make sure that the filing has uh, the correct data for the starting spot. We make sure that uh, they use reasonable assumptions, not excessive, uh, not too aggressive, uh, to get from the base period to the projected period, and we make sure that the calculations uh, that are used are uh, correct and appropriate for that uh, calculation. This results in a rate increase request uh, based on where the rates are today, and that's what these uh, numbers represent. So for the Kaiser individual filing, requesting a 3.5% decrease, that takes the weighted average of all the plans, puts them together, and the uh, net reduction is 3.5% as they stated. So looking specifically at the Kaiser individual filing, we looked at the company's uh, experience that they use, 37,000 members, a very credible uh, base uh, to base their pricing on. Uh, we were also able to reproduce the calculations they use and uh, those calculations were correct. So the bulk of the review though is checking these assumptions and there are several assumptions that go into each of these filings. For example, one of the primary drivers of uh, a rate increase is a medical trend. They used a medical trend of two and a half percent. This is lower than last year. Last year they used the three and a half percent. The net impact is that rates, uh, this has a lower needed uh, increase for 2021 versus the 2020 rates. They also did not include a COVID-19 uh, rate impact. That does not mean that they uh, anticipate no COVID-19 costs but that the, the premiums that they are requesting are sufficient for them to uh, handle the expected costs, uh, including the impact of COVID-19. And I'm going to ask them at the end of this to uh, if there has been any changes in the uh, emerging data that would uh, affect uh, their assumptions that go into their uh, filing. But currently they have not identified any. There is also a couple factors that we talk about with the individual filings. Uh, one is the risk adjustment and one is the reinsurance. The risk adjustment calculation is a company with sicker population would be at a uh, net deficit compared to the entire market. And in this case, the market is the entire state of the individual plans. Um, and as a company with low risk would uh, be a net payer into the risk adjustment program. And the important thing of the risk adjustment uh, calculation is that it is a net sum zero, meaning that we expect every dollar that's paid in by one company to be received by another company. This has effect of lowering the volatility of the rates and to stabilize the marketplace. And uh, as we've been watching this since the uh, risk adjustment program began, uh, we are seeing fairly stable rates in the state of Oregon. Uh, we check the carrier's risk adjustment assumptions with their own experience. We check it against the entire state. And we, uh, at the end of the day, we had no concerns with the calculations uh, made on these filings. The reinsurance calculation is how much the carrier expects to get from the Oregon reinsurance program, which is a level funded amount with uh, an anticipated funding of approximately $108 million with the goal to lower uh, the rates in the individual market by approximately 8%. Part of that is to offset the 2% assessment uh, that uh, the state has against the same plans, so a net 6% decrease. We look at each of these companies and uh, again, and we look at the statewide totals. Kaiser has a lower than average expected uh, 
reinsurance amount for their filings, which means that they have a lower reduction to their plans. But this is consistent with their business model uh, where the uh, network is closed and specific to Kaiser. They have more control over the costs. That's why they're able to keep their trends low. That's why they're able to keep their utilization low. It's consistent with all the other calculations that would otherwise reduce their rates further. So they reduce their rates uh, by lower trends, but they don't reduce it by the same uh, as much when they uh, do their reinsurance. This is not only uh, reasonable for the company, but it's consistent within the filing. All the assumptions seem to be going in the same direction. And that's something we like to see. We have no concerns with any of the calculations we've seen in the Kaiser filing. Uh, we also check their administrative uh, costs, their taxes and fees, make sure they're appropriate, uh, make sure that they match what we know of the marketplace today. Uh, we also make sure that the company does not anticipate a rebate under the medical loss ratio uh, rebate program on the, the, uh, the uh, federal government's ACA plan, which means that they have to have an anticipated loss ratio greater than 80%. And in this case, uh, we found no issues with any of these calculations, any of these assumptions. At the end of the Kaiser filing, we uh, the Kaiser individual filing, we had uh, no findings, no concerns with this filing. Uh, their, uh, our preliminary decision is to approve the 3.5% uh, rate decrease as requested. Uh, before we get to talk about the uh, emerging data for COVID, I will quickly go over the small group filing, which is very similar in calculation, very similar in the assumptions because uh, uh, there's a lot of overlap between the uh, small group and individual market, but I will talk uh, to some of the differences. First, Kaiser uh, small group filing uh, uses the small group experience instead of the individual experience. That's appropriate, uh, we have no concerns. The uh, COVID assumptions also zero in there, but there is no reinsurance program. So uh, the 8% reduction for the reinsurance payments, that exists on the individual filing, not the small group filing. We take a look at the same aggregates across the entire small group market as we do for the individual uh, filings. Kaiser is consistent between its two filings. It's consistent with the markets for individual and the markets for small group. We also uh, have a preliminary decision to approve the 3.5% increase on the small group filing. So I would like to give it back to Kaiser to talk a little bit about any emerging data that they have seen over the past couple months uh, for COVID-19 that might uh, shed a little more insight into 2021. And we included three questions uh, in the preliminary decision out there on SURF, if you could uh, uh, walk through those for us. Yeah, this is uh, Luke Hampton here. So for your first question where you asked about has emerging data changed our original estimates of COVID costs for 2020 slash 2021, at this time, we feel our original estimates are still valid for the cost that, from what we include in the filing. Your second question was, is the company requesting any change for 2021 rates due to the emerging data? And the emerging data has not led us to believe we need to change our current 2021 rates at this time. And your last question was, how will postponed claims this year affect pent-up demand and utilization in 2021? We want to say this is very hard to quantify without knowing when or if a vaccine will be available. If a vaccine is available in early 2021, we might see some pent-up demand as people might have more desire and feel more comfortable going to see the doctor. It is also expected we will see some type of a permanent shift to virtual visits in the future. However, the extent is unknown at this time. And is there any reason uh, for those answers to be different for individual or small group? Uh, no, the answers are the same for the individual. All right, thank you for th those responses. And uh, that ends my uh, portion of the preliminary decision. 
I give this back to Ethan. Thank you, Michael. Kaiser, do you have any additional information or comments you'd like to make at this time? I do not. Uh, I do not either. Great, thank you. We will open it up to public comment. Um, is there anyone on the phone that would like to unmute and make a comment? All right, well, I will remind everyone listening that comments will be accepted online at www.oregonhealthrates.org uh, till about midnight tonight, 11.59 p.m. Next, we'll hear from Providence. We'll pause briefly. All right, Providence, please begin by introducing yourselves and explaining your rate request. Sure, and uh, thank you. This is uh, Brian McGuire representing uh, Providence on the individual and small group rate filings. Um, also uh, with me from Providence is Sean Savage, our actuarial manager. And um, Sean's gonna take everyone through um, some of the basic rate filing information, um, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have after that. Brian, um, as you said, I'm Sean Savage. I'm a manager on the actuary team here at Providence. Um, our average rate increase for 2021 in individual is 1.4% for continuing members, with a minimum rate change of negative 3.7% and a maximum rate change of 5.3%. In small group, our average rate increase is 3.3% for continuing plans, with a minimum rate change of negative 4.4% and a maximum rate change of 6.9%. Our small group quarterly rate increase is 1.3% per quarter. As of March, our members that will be impacted by these changes, in individual, we have 62,000 members, and in small group, we have 53,000 members. In individual, no plans have been discontinued or added for 2021, and in small group, our choice plans have been reintroduced for 2021, and no plans are discontinued. The following factors have been revised in both the individual and small group since the last filing benefit plan designs and relativity, geographic factors, trend, and network adjustments. Since the filing was originally submitted, Providence Health Plan has removed our 1% rate impact for COVID-19. Our rate increases mentioned earlier reflect this change. While there is still tremendous uncertainty, the observed reduction in elective procedures was larger than we originally anticipated. In combination with the emergence of additional COVID cases as the economy reopens, we made the decision to remove our 1% rate impact for COVID. We continue to assess the evidence, our internal assumptions, and expert opinions on the duration and severity of the pandemic and mitigation efforts. While the expenses associated with the vaccine and COVID-related hospitalizations are material, on balance, we expect them to be offset by continued lowered utilization in 2021. Also, as the final 2019 CMS risk adjustment report has not been released, Providence Health Plan requests the opportunity to, to adjust our rates after we review the results of the final risk adjustment report. Thanks, Sean. So that's the end of our uh, introductory okay. comments. Perfect. Thank you. Division staff will now lead a discussion about the division's review of the filings and preliminary decisions. Thank you, Ethan. Michael. Uh, my name is Michael Six, Senior Life and Health Actuary and Primary Reviewer of this filing. This is Andrew. I'm the secondary review of the fact. Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Um, Lou Savage, Administrator, uh, Division of Financial Regulation. Uh, TK Keene, Deputy Administrator. And Brian Fordham, sitting in for Tasha Sizemore and DFR. All right. Thank you. I will uh, now go into the details of the Providence individual and small group filing rate reviews. Uh, 
I'm going to first discuss the Providence individual filing and the assumptions and findings of that filing. Then I will move on to the small group filing. Uh, there are a couple of things that are different between the two, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the small group filing. But so the, uh, predominantly, we will uh, be looking at the individual filing. First, I would like to point out uh, that on the Providence individual filing, uh, there was some confusion at the beginning uh, what the actual request was. And at some points, they had 2.6%. Some points, they had 2.4% average annual increase. And the difference between these, as uh, determined in the objections, is the point in time which they did their weighting average. So when we talk 2.6% or we talk 2.4%, it is the same rate between the two. We're not talking any differences in the actual rates, but how they are weighted to get to those numbers. For the remainder of this decision, I will be using the latter number of 2.4% original rate request. Um, the numbers of uh, members impacted over 60,000 people. Providence is using their own experience. Uh, and we will start from there. So we look at three places in the filing, three predominant uh, categories uh, in the filings for our review. First, we look at the source data. What are they using as a starting point to determine uh, the 2021 rates. And that starting point is usually the most recent rate request from last year, the experience from 2019. Uh, risk adjustment factors, which are estimated as of today, as Providence noted, and will be finalized shortly. Those could have an impact on the rates. We will take a look at that. But uh, for now, we look at their starting point. Their starting point is their own experience, 64,000 members, plenty of experience uh, for uh, a credible starting point for the filing. We had no concerns with that. We also, uh, just looking at the uh, uh, calculations, are the calculations accurate? Are the calculations correct? We were able to reproduce the calculations and these calculations were correct. The rest of the filing, has to do with checking the assumptions that go into the filing. And Providence did mention a few of those, the trend, the COVID impacts, uh, risk adjustment, reinsurance, uh, the administrative costs and fees that go into these filings. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the most significant uh, factors that will adjust a rate. And the primary driver of uh, health insurance rates is the medical trend factor. And Providence used a 7.2% allowed medical uh, factor. There are some other adjustments that go in there, but that is more of a calculation, not an assumption that goes into the filing. So with the 7.2%, we compare that to the market. We compare that to other carriers. We compare that to other states. We compare that to national uh, trends and experience out there. And we did not find that Providence's assumptions were out of line with other carriers in the market. We did not find that it was out of line with what we know in the, uh, the national uh, medical trends. Um, one important uh, thing we noticed in national trends is that there is considered a, a large impact anticipated uh, in 2021 for uh, COVID-19. And that's an important part of this filing as well. Uh, the national numbers were giving uh, values of uh, five, approximately 5% uh, load for COVID-19. And Providence, while they did anticipate costs for COVID-19, only loaded their rates for 1%. So that uncertainty is being uh, put into other areas of the uh, filing. And we will talk about the impacts that that has on the filing with uh, questions to uh, Providence after I'm uh, done here. But what uh, is the expected cost for medical claims uh, based on what we know happening in 2020? There's not a vaccine, there's not a, uh, a 
there's no real known uh, answer. What does the antibodies uh, tell us? We don't have a long-term answer for COVID-19 today. So we're going to talk about that emerging data and how that impacts uh, Providence in just a moment. But they have only loaded uh, in the initial rate request, they loaded 1% into the filing. And since then, then, they have taken that 1% and dropped it down to zero. So now they are not loading for COVID-19 at all in the rates. So uh, at that point, we're looking at this from not only a the trend number is reasonable within the market, it's reasonable for this company, but that trend is also holding the burden of the COVID-19 impacts and all the other uncertainty factors. So that's something we keep in mind. We did not find the trend uh, assumption excessive. Uh, we did not find it unreasonable. The next factor, I've already covered COVID-19, is the risk adjustment factor. Uh, and I'll talk about risk adjustment and reinsurance kind of in the same blanket. These are factors that are programs. The risk adjustment program is a measure of the risk relative to other carriers in the market. A, a company with high risk would then receive payments from a company with low risk. And the risk adjustment program is a net zero sum. The purpose of this program is so that companies who do get an, uh, an, a significant amount of the uh, unhealthy members in a market does not end up increasing their rates and driving unhealthy members to a company with lower rates. So this risk adjustment balances it out, creates some stability in the marketplace. It's been around since 2014. Uh, Oregon has been fairly stable uh, as a state and that, that continues into 2021. We've compared what Providence has submitted to the rest of the state. We have no concerns with their risk adjustment calculations. Similar, we have the reinsurance program. That is a state-run program, approximately $108 million for 2021 to reduce the overall individual premiums by 8%. Part of that is to offset the 2% assessment that is attached to the same uh, members. So a net 6% reduction for the state reinsurance program. Providence uh, has a expected uh, risk or reinsurance impact of slightly higher uh, than average. And we've uh, noted that, but in total, if you add up all the carriers across the marketplace, they are right there at the budgeted amount. So uh, it, we did not find that Providence was being overly aggressive in their pricing. Uh, it would be difficult to argue that they were conservative at, because this reinsurance amount is reducing their rates. So they're actually reducing their rates more while they have a higher trend. It is consistent within themselves and it is consistent with the marketplace. We have no concern with their reinsurance calculations. The remainder of the calculations are more based on things we know in the numbers we know in the marketplace for 2021. Uh, the administrative costs they give us, but uh, there's taxes and fees that are already set. Uh, we make sure that those are appropriate within the uh, allowable levels. And we make sure that when they're pricing that they don't have so much administrative costs that they would uh, price resulting in a rebate. Uh, if they were pricing uh, to result in a medical rebate, it would be a sign that the company has possibly uh, needs to cut back on their administrative costs. We did not find that with these filings. Uh, they did not, uh, we did not have any concerns with their calculation on administrative costs. At the end of the day, we did not have any concerns with their filing, uh, individual filing, and we are recommending uh, that we approve their request. However, uh, in the last few moments uh, before the uh, decision was reached, Providence approached us and asked to reduce that COVID impact down from one percent down to, from one percent down to zero percent, and they were going to reduce their rate request from two point four percent down to one point four percent. That actually has a small calculation error because they are only reducing the impact on claims. They aren't 
adjusting the impact on the administrative costs. So it would be slightly less than 1%, but they've asked for a flat 1% reduction in their rates. Uh, it's splitting hairs at this point to have that tiny little margin uh, and raise their rates a little bit more than they asked for. So we are, uh, our preliminary decision is to approve the 1% rate increase as modified by the company. Then we move on to the small group filing. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is very similar to the individual filing in both construction and the assumptions that go in. So I will talk about some of the differences. Uh, they still had the 1% COVID impact, uh, they did, which they brought down to 1.0. They started out at a request, and this, uh, just like the individual filing, there's some confusion. Is it 3.9% or 4.3? depends on uh, the timing of the calculation, we are going to be using the 4.3%. Since Providence is asked to lower that 1%, we are talking about a modified request of 3.3%. The trend for small group is lower than individual. Uh, they are only using a 5.1% allowed trend for small group while using a 7.2% in individual. Uh, this has to do a lot with the stability of small group and the type of risk that small group uh, uh, gets in comparison to the individual market. Uh, it is also something we have seen year after, in after, uh, year, after year, and we have uh, uh, gotten, uh, we have established that this relationship exists between the two markets. So they've got a lower trend. They're not uh, loading for COVID-19 uh, with their uh, with their modification. Uh, administrative costs are the same. There is no reinsurance program uh, for the small group market. That is only an individual market uh, program. And so at the end of the day, we have the same uh, the same calculations. Uh, using their own source data, plenty of experience, getting to a uh, calculation that we find reasonable and correct. So our preliminary decision on the small group rate filing is to approve the 3.3% modified rate increase. Uh, I would like to go back to Providence and get their responses to our three questions related to COVID-19. Uh, we know they have reduced their uh, filing, but there are two others talking about how the emerging data uh, impacts the rate request. So, Providence, if you could uh, discuss those. Sure. Um, yeah, so we reduced our, um, our rate request based on uh, emerging data. And, um, you know, at the time of the rate filing, we had almost – um, no information in terms of claims experience um, under uh, the quarantine. Um, as of, you know, more recently, we've gotten updates, and, and to us it looks like the, the impact of deferred procedures was bigger than we had anticipated. Um, the other piece of information is, is that, um, you know, we've seen – more recent uptick in, in cases and hospitalizations around the country. Um, so we do think that there's some risk of a possible um, shutdown or deferred procedures again sometime in 2021 that would offset uh, or potentially offset some of the additional costs that we anticipate. Um, we, we do think that the, the risk of, I mean, for, for public health, it's a benefit, but for Insurers, there is a pretty material risk of a, a approved vaccine um, that that you know kind of washes away the rest of this due to the high cost. Um, but we're trying to weigh those things, and we're assessing the evidence and and monitoring closely, just like everyone else is. Um, and we, we thought that taking that one percent out made sense, especially with all the uncertainty and and um, trying to minimize the impact on our members. All right, thank you. 
And that concludes my review and preliminary decision for the Providence filings. I'll send it back to Ethan. Thank you. Providence, is there anything else you'd like to add at this time? Nothing further. Great. Thank you. We will now open it up to public testimony. Please unmute and introduce yourself. Hi there. Uh, this is Laura Johnson. I'm here with uh, SEIU Local 49. Yeah. You guys hear me okay? <laughs> yep, we yep, can hear thanks. you. Okay, terrific. Yep. Um, so first, just thanks so much for the opportunity to comment on the rate filings and to participate in this important process. So as I mentioned, I'm here today with SEIU Local 49. We're comp a union comprised of healthcare and property service workers throughout Oregon and Southwest Washington. Our mission is to achieve a higher standard of living for our members, their families, and dependents by elevating their social conditions and by striving to create a more just society. So on SEIU's behalf, I'd just like to respectfully raise the following concerns related to the 2021 rate filing submitted by Providence Health Plan for their individual offerings. So over the last few years, as many of you know, we've seen a disturbing trend of an increase in uninsured individuals here in Oregon, uh, a trend that will continue if costs remain difficult to afford. We believe this issue is even more dire now with COVID-19 as hundreds of thousands in our state have lost their jobs or seen hours drastically cut. It's more important than ever that coverage remain affordable for everyone who needs it. So for this reason, we believe that Providence's uh, requested individual profit margin of 4% is unwarranted. It's the highest requested margin among all individual plans tied with Bridgespan. This margin comes directly out of our patient, <clears throat> patients' pockets, exacerbating already significant challenges that people have uh, affording health insurance. Meanwhile, Providence Health Plan has $600 million in reserves and is not in danger of failing to meet its financial obligations to its plan members as its risk-based capital ratio is healthy, 7.7. In closing, uh, we're disappointed also to see the lack of detail and nuance provided by most insurers on how they arrived at their cost and utilization numbers. Providence Health Plan's lack of disclosure is particularly troubling though, because Providence negotiates with itself for more than one third of its medical services, which is a share that's been steadily increasing in recent years. So at a minimum, we urge DCBS to inquire how Providence Health Plan negotiates and sets rates with its own Providence providers and how this differs or if it differs from other large providers of medical services to members. And with that, I just wanna thank you again for your time and for considering these comments as you make your final decision about rates, your role in safeguarding access to and affordability of care for all Oregonians is critically important and particularly at this current moment. So thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone else on the line who would like to make a comment at this time? All right, well, let me remind everyone listening that today, July 8th, is the last day for public comments. They can be submitted through our website, www.oregonhealthrates.org. Thank you, and that concludes today's hearing.